Welcome back to Book Break and happy International Women's Day. Now I am going to talk about five incredible women in today's video. These are all women who have released truly brilliant books this year and I have come here to tell you about them to Sketch. Now Sketch is a fantastic place to celebrate International Women's Day, not just because it's a favourite place to come with your girlfriends, though that is also true, and not just because it is all themed in this beautiful colour of pink. And pink is of course a colour that has a really interesting history when it comes to gender. For the longest time it was actually assigned to baby boys because it was considered the strongest colour as opposed to dainty delicate blue that was given to girls. And no one really knows when that switched, when clothing manufacturers started assigning pink as a girly colour, but whatever the reason we are reclaiming it now as a strong colour for womanhood. But that's still not why I chose Sketch as the perfect place to celebrate International Women's Day. It's actually because this building played a really fascinating role in feminist history. So back in 1869, suffragist Millicent Fawcett delivered a speech here at the first ever public suffrage rally, and Sketch actually have a room upstairs named after her in her honour. But let's move on and talk about five more fantastic women and the books they've released this year that I have really loved, and think you will too. So the first book on my list is Gingerbread by Helen Oyemi. And first, can we just look at this beautiful gold cover? And the inside is wonderfully weird. I have already read this book twice and felt like I've uncovered so much more each time I've gone back to it. So it's about three generations of the Lee women, Margot, Harriet and Perdita. And they make this gingerbread that is so delicious and so enchanting that even Perdita, who is a celiac, cannot resist it. So reading this book made me seriously crave gingerbread. And the recipe for this gingerbread has been in their family for generations. They learned it back when they lived in a far off land named Druhastrana, which now, now they live in London, Harriet keeps obsessively googling, only to be repeatedly told by Wikipedia that this country doesn't exist. So we have two main timelines in the book. In the present day, Harriet is telling her daughter Perdita about her childhood in Druhastrana, and then we also flash back and see that story play out. What's weird though is that both of these timelines seem to be totally timeless. Even back in Harriet's childhood, they still have phones and texting. And that's only one of the weird and wonderful things about this book. We also have dolls that are half doll, half plant, and are very talkative. And there's a house that they once used to live in where the rooms could travel up and down through the floors. Overall, Gingerbread is a really beautiful book about home and about family and belonging. And it is very dark and sweet at the same time, just like Gingerbread itself. The next book I want to tell you about is The Distance Home by Paula Saunders, and oh my god this book is so sad. It's about siblings Renee and Leon, and it's about their relationship with each other and also with their parents, even Al. So Renee and Leon are both really talented and passionate dancers, but this is something that their father Al adores in Renee but hates in Leon. And then their mother Eve reacts to Al's neglect of Leon by picking on Renee and thinking that she is entitled and selfish. So essentially both parents pick a favourite child and end up causing them irreparable damage along the way. And just to make it even sadder, the book actually starts with a flash forward, so right from the beginning we know that Leon has already died quite young, which just makes it even sadder watching him become more and more troubled knowing what's going to happen in the end. So not a cheery book, but it is absolutely beautifully written and you will care so deeply about these characters. Now The Braid by Letitia Columbani is a really lovely story of intertwining lives. So we have three women, there's Smita who lives in India and she belongs to the lowest caste of society who are considered untouchables, but she is determined to find a better life for her daughter. And then in Sicily we meet Julia who works at her father's wig factory, a business that is slowly dying out in Italy. And finally in Canada we meet Sarah, a lawyer who is perfectly balancing her very high pressure job with being a single mother to three children until she learns that she has breast cancer. So these three women's lives are braided together. Without ever knowing about each other's existence, they are linked by the hair that passes from one to another at turning points in each of their lives. And their stories are incredibly different, their lives are very, very different, but they are each so brave in different ways. And I absolutely shot through this book all in one day, I just couldn't put it down. Next, The Glove Maker by Anne Weisgerber. Now this is a fascinating historical fiction book set in 1880s Utah, and it's about the small Mormon town of Junction, which has just eight families in it. 
and I didn't really know anything about this period, so it was amazing to learn about it. And it's rather a sad story in some ways. So the main character, Deborah, her husband Samuel works away from town several months at a time, and he was expected back at the beginning of December, and we now find ourselves in a snowy, cold, dangerous January. He still hasn't made it back. So that's this constant, rather sad backdrop. We don't know what's happened to Samuel, but we get to read some of his letters home and see how much he loves his wife, and we start to really worry that something might have happened to him. But we also have this really tense story happening in Junction. So it starts with a man who shows up at Deborah's door on the run from the law and asks for help. And she agrees to help him, not knowing quite how much danger she would end up putting herself in. And it's this tiny little town, essentially trapped in their homes because of the snow, trying to keep this secret. So it's really tense and claustrophobic feeling. And there's an author's note at the end saying that it was based on these true stories and this true town, which is just so fascinating to hear about. And finally, I've got It's Not About the Burqa, which is an amazing collection of essays edited by Mariam Khan. And it features contributors from the activist Mona El Tahawi to the author Sophia Ahmed. And this book is the answer to the way that Muslim women are obsessed over in Western media, particularly in regards to the way they dress, whether they do or don't wear the burqa or the hijab, whether they are or aren't being oppressed. But whether it's Islamophobes or liberal feminists arguing over them, there's actually one key thing that they have in common, they are not letting Muslim women speak for themselves. So in this essay collection, that finally changes. These are Muslim women talking about what's important to them. And spoiler alert, it's not about the burqa. These essays are about faith, they're about feminism, about sexuality, and about mental health. And my personal favourite one to read was the essay contributed by the editor Mariam Khan herself, and it's called Feminism Needs to Die. And as a feminist myself, I found it really important to read because it's all about how mainstream white feminism is failing women of colour and women of faith, and how we really need to change and grow and improve if we can ever claim that we're fighting on behalf of all women. So those were five of my favourite books by women that I've read recently, but please do comment below letting me know your favourites, I always want more recommendations. And of course do give this video a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button below because we post new videos on this channel every Thursday. And coming up next week we've got a really fab guest host who's going to tell us about some of her favourite Irish writers. And in the meantime, you can always go and follow our Instagram, at BritBritUK, we've got loads of really fun behind the scenes content over there. See you next time!